morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning, everyone. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> it's nice to be sharing this morning with you all. <clears throat> I love that line, uh, pursuing the dharmas of others is fraught with spiritual danger. I grew up um, without any kind of particular spiritual guidance. Uh, I did not grow up in a religion. In fact, in high school, if anybody was to ask who was the least likely person to ever have any uh, conversations about God, I would have been at the top of the list. And um, it was because I had an intuitive knowledge that there was a way that life existed that we could be in life that was full of confidence, was full of a sense of wholeness, and that had joy and adventure and delight and kindness and love, but not kindness in a soppy kind of way, kindness that inspired and uplifted. Um, and there was nothing that I saw in religion um, that reflected that. And so I went the way of science, because in science at least you could discover um, truths about how life worked. And um, that was great, but it wasn't enough. I went far into college and in the sciences, and I discovered that it was wonderful to be able to have provable uh, results about how life works, but it was still always external. And my professors did not particularly inspire me, most of them. Some of them were great characters, but none of them really left me with a sense of, God, they have got what I want, and if I just do another lab experiment, I can and blow up one more thing and get the smoke to rise and turn the, the test tube a funny color, I can make it all work. And I went through nature, and I would backpack and hike and find myself out in deeply inspired, uh, inspiring moments, out having um, hiked many miles and um, really taxed myself to the limit. And I could feel glimmers of something awakening inside. But it wasn't, it wasn't resilient. It, wasn't, um, it didn't last. It didn't stay with. And still that hunger to know, that hunger to uh, experience life, welcome, to experience life more fully, experience something inside more fully was there. And I really didn't know where to look. And I tried business. I tried money. I tried I mean, just you name it. I, I went through the uh, circus. And um, it wasn't until somebody handed me the autobiography of a yogi that I um, recognized that there was somebody, there was somebody who had uh, intimate knowledge of what it was that I was seeking. And the autobiography of a yogi is a wonderful book. It's a bizarre book. And if just from standard Western American values, and I see a lot of new faces, so I'm talking a lot to people who are new to the path, new to being here, and all the all the things that are here, as well as people who've been around for many, many, many decades. But what what was clear in there was that he was speaking universally. He was speaking to each individual, and he was saying that there is something that is possible in life that fulfills every single thing. You know, every one of us, every single one of us wakes up in the morning with a sense that life has possibilities. There's an infinite sense of possibility every single morning. And we go to bed, most of us, every night, having fallen far short of that. Is it, is it booming? No? OK. Um, and so. What he said is, there is a key. There is a key for you that will take care of matching your experience at night with your expectations of the morning. And will start to fill the circadian clock. It will start to fill the days with everything you've been looking for. 
And he said, it is not constrained to any given religion. We had a very interesting, um, uh, we have a privilege, a deep and profound privilege, which is to share um, the teachings that we're going to describe here in a few minutes um, through a, a course. We typically teach it over 14 weeks, four hours a night, uh, once a week. But we also do it as an intensive. And we just had the pleasure and the blessing to do it as a week-long intensive out at our retreat facility. It's the art and science of Raja Yoga. And it is the, the investigation into the, the practices, the, the patterns of life, the behaviors, the understandings that, that match up the evening and the morning. And somebody said to me, or you know, somebody said at the end of the week, they said, you know, a little more respect for all the other religions would be helpful. And I thought about it. That was a very interesting piece of feedback. Because this path, I'm going to read, this is this little book. This little book, I'm, I must not be a good translator, is what it, it said to me. Because this little book, this is a... This is a scripture that Paramahansa Yogananda brought into this world. It is a book of prayer demands and poems. He said every single, every single little one of these has been taken until there was a response from spirit. And they are so universal. But at the very beginning, the very first page, the uh, dedication page, it says, dedicated unto all the soul temples of Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hebrews, Hindus, and others, wherein the cosmic heart throbs equally, always. And unto the multicolored lamps of all true teachings, in which shines the, the same one white flame of God. And unto all churches, mosques, viharas, tabernacles, and temples of the world, wherein our own one Father dwells impartially, in the fullness of his glory. So what Yogananda wrote and what Yogananda brought and what is represented here is something that is absolutely universal and applicable to every single individual. And it responds to the most, most profound and deep yearning of the heart of every individual. It's the yearning for wholeness, the yearning for joy. And what Yogananda said was, if if you really want fulfillment, you know, most people seek it in ways that it cannot last. We seek it outwardly, and we seek it in our relationships. We seek it in our friendships. We seek it in our marriages and children. We seek it in our jobs, in our homes, in our cars, in our wealth, in our fame, in our fortune. And there's nothing overtly wrong with any single thing in this world, period in having any of those, being involved in any of those, except that they do not last and they cannot respond to that deep yearning of the heart. And so he said, instead of putting the attention on those things, it's fine to do them. But what's important is to put the attention into the places where you can fill up with what you're looking for. And then, good news, great news, that energy, that light, that joy, that freedom spills out into your relationships, into your job, into your family, into your children, into everything that's there. We are, we're so hungry, and we so don't know how to look. And we define ourselves by our outer relationship to things, thinking that I am this, and if I can do it, and our culture and our, and our um, uh, media and the message of our culture is, is exactly this, that if you were just a little different, if you were just a little different, then you'd be OK. If you were a little younger, then you could be happy. If you were a little skinnier, then you could be happy. If you were a little nicer, then you could be happy. If you were a little richer, if you had a better job, if you, were, if you were a guy instead of a girl, if you were a girl instead of a guy, if you were a different race, if you were a different color, if you had three children instead of two, if you had two children instead of three, then you could be happy. And it's all a lie. 
It is all just unadulterated a lie. If Daiva would just behave better, then you could be happy. Now that's true. <laughs> Maybe not. But that's, that's the common thought, that one thought. You, I would be happy if that everybody is carrying that package around. And it's a self-identifier because it says, I'm not blank, and therefore I must. And we just spend our time changing. And then we get those things, and we go, well, that's nice, but that's not it. It's not enough. Every single person is made the same. At the very center of who we are, every single person is made the same. We're all uniquely different on the surface. It's like the difference in vehicles. Um, you know, every car is made extremely differently in terms of how the pieces are put together, but you always put the gas in the gas tank, right? You always put water in the radiator, you all, or radiator fluid in the radiator. You always put air in the tires. You don't put air in the gas tank and gas in the tires, and you don't, we're all made the same. The way it works for all of us is exactly the same. And every true religion, every one of these things, you know, every vihara, every temple, every tabernacle, every um, soul temple, every true teaching, takes us in one direction. It takes us in one direction. If it's true, where does it take us? Into the center of ourselves, into the stillness of our own nature. The Bible, if you took one line from the Bible and threw everything else away, the Bible would be worth having. You know what that one line is? Be still and know. Every other line in the Bible supports that one suggestion. It's how do you find out, how do you know the truth of creation, the truth of reality. Swami Kriyananda, he's a, I'm going to go sideways here for just a second, both physically and also conversationally. You got some funny little guy up here sitting in cross-legged lotus pose. And for some of you, that's, that's obvious. And for some, it may be a little odd. But what that pose represents is the posture of absolute stillness wherein we reclaim our own nature. And is it necessary to sit in that pose? No. Sitting up straight, our shoulders back, heart open, chin level, eyes gently raised, spine straight. That's the posture that represents. Cross-legged like that is fabulous. It's very supportive of that exact posture, the spine straight, but the ability to relax in that posture. And this fellow who's up here, he was, a, he was an accountant for the, for the Indian Railway, but he had come already. He had already, through lifetimes, he had worked on finding that stillness inside and perfected it. And he realized the value it had for every single person and he brought into this world and shared it with Muslims, with Sikhs, with, with Christians, with Hindus, with anybody who came who was sincere. He taught the teachings of how to become still so that that individual could find themselves and fill up with joy, fill up with love, fill up with the, everything that we want. You know, it's funny to see, and I, I, I can mock it a little bit because I have been there and I know the pain of yearning. You know, the people who are out protesting for peace. Swami Kriyananda made a beautiful comment. He said, you know, if you want peace on earth, you have to start with the peace of earth in which you live. You have to have peace in your heart. You can't be restlessly out there shouting, um, you know, and antagonistically demanding peace you're putting into the ether the very vibration you say you're trying to eliminate. We have to have the power of peace inside. We have to have the power. If we want to see love in this world, we have to stop the mental noise that creates divisiveness and degrades others and holds them at a distance and judges them. We have to learn to behave. We have to learn to open our hearts in the presence of spirit in silence so that it can fill us up. This is from um, a book. Patanjali is the foremost. Yoga means union. And what these, what these masters brought and what Yogananda speaks of is the, the science of yoga, which can be practiced by any religion, any person, any faith, anywhere. 
is the simple practices of yoga that help us go into stillness. And Patanjali was the foremost proponent of yoga from, from several thousand years ago. And his sutras have been um, carried forward through the ages, but often very hard to understand. Swami Kriyananda wrote, he's a saint, and he wrote a very simple line right through the heart of these, of these great teachings. And he says as a preface, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras are a stirring cry to us to, to transcend all religious differences. Their basic message is, here are methods that can be tested and proved. You can know what God is from personal experience. Paramahansa Yogananda declared that the future of religion everywhere would be self-realization, actual experience of the universal self, actual experience of God inside yourself. Patanjali tells us how to attain the state of divine oneness. In the past, and to a large extent even today, religion has been equated with a system of belief. Everyone, everywhere, it has been assumed that God cannot be known and that we must accept some authority's opinions about him. People have fought in defense of those opinions. Muslims zealous to force conversion on others have gone so far as to slaughter people by the masses and in the belief that they were pleasing Allah. Human folly can hardly rise higher than the promise of sensual delights in heaven to any thug who sacrifices his life to bring about such conversion. That's a fairly strong indictment, but it's a sincere indictment. Religion everywhere offers us attainment of the highest state that is in us and then boxes us in with sectarianism, intolerance, and threats of divine punishment to anyone who fails to toe the line. Patanjali offers attainments far higher than any sensual heaven. He also fills our minds with forgiveness, genuine, all-embracing love, and understanding. Patanjali brings to mankind more than a fresh breath of truth. He brings the wind of a new reality, redolent with fresh drafts of hope, not only for a better, but a perfect future. But that future depends on one thing. That perfect future depends on us perfecting ourselves, us reaching past the illusions of this world into the stillness of our own nature and allowing that to open and fill up with the presence of those qualities that we so desperately seek. It's the only place we'll find them. And it's the one thing that this church has to offer. You know, we have people in here who are Jewish. We have people in here who have been Muslim. We have people in here who have been, have been Christian. We have people, or are Christian, or are Hindu. It doesn't matter the outer form of worship that you take. It doesn't matter who inspires you outwardly. You can put any picture on your wall. You can have anything, anything that inspires you as a good thing, anything that opens your heart should be celebrated. Anything that inspires you to strive more should be, should be sought after and referred to. But unless we take the time in silence, unless we take the time to feel for the presence of God ourselves, nothing's happening. These pictures don't change us. They can remind us of what's possible. Pictures of St. Francis, pictures of the Indian saints, Pictures of Muslim saints, one of my favorite people in this world. I don't think I spoke maybe 20 sentences with him. But he, he is with me constantly because he was such a remarkable individual. He was a, uh, a Muslim cleric down in Nevada City, California. I worked with him as a, um, as a hospital chaplain. And he was part of the chaplaincy program. And he never said much. He was a very quiet man. He was from someplace in the, in the east. But when he smiled and when he did speak, there was so much richness in his presence. There was so much richness in his voice. We should be like that to each other and to anyone we meet. We should have so much light, so much kindness, so much joy, so much lack of self-remembrance that nothing anybody does affects us personally. And then we start to fulfill the promise of every religion and the promise of every scripture, which is that spirit can be known. And it can not only be known as something far, far away from us, 
Because it is. You know, God is in the farthest points of the cosmos and beyond. But he's also in the very center of our heart. As one saint said, the nearest of the near and the dearest of the dear. God is right there. And when we contact him inside, we also connect with the farthest points in the cosmos. Because at the center of everything, there's just one vibration. And it's made of love. It's made of joy. It's made of peace and calmness. And if we're not experiencing that, we need to go deeper into the center. We need to go deeper. And we need tools. That's what yoga is. Yoga is the tools that allow the Muslims and the Catholics and the, and the Protestants and the Hindus and the, and the um, Hawaiian shamans and the, uh, the, what are they called, Steve? Uh, the, the, the holy men of, of Hawaii. Kahunas, thank you. I couldn't get the, oh, Bimal, thank you. <laughs> We've got a visitor here from, yeah, I couldn't, get, I couldn't get the word out. There's some great stories of some of the really, um, one of the great stories of, of Hawaii was this, this Christian missionary went over to Hawaii and he landed and he was converting everybody and stuff. But he, he left his wife back at home and, you know, he was, he was converting the heathen. And one day, this kahuna came up to him, this, this Hawaiian holy man, and he'd been downgrading, you know, and, and really um, dissing the Hawaiian religion and the Hawaiian um, mysticism. And this kahuna came up to him and said, um, excuse me, uh, sir, but I have a message for you. And he said, what could it possibly be? He said, your wife is deathly ill. And he said, how do you know? And he said, would you like me to show you how I know? And the man said, yes, because he hadn't heard anything. It was, you know, this was, takes months for messages to get back and forth from where he was from. And the kahuna said, follow me. And they went deep into the, into the uh, Hawaiian jungle. And he was walking down this path, and then he stopped. And he, he said, OK, so now I want you to look over here. And there was this, this little window that he looked into. It was just this, this place. And there. On the other side was his wife, in bed, ill. The kahuna was able to see past time and space, and had, gotten, had tuned in to this man so deeply that he could feel his further reality, because we're all connected in spirit. And, and of course, the, the Christian missionary was um, taken aback, both because of his wife, because of what just happened, how it happened, who did it. And it changed his entire, his entire relationship to his ministry. Um, the kuhuna blessed the, the wife, and she was healed. And um, you know, all these messages coming back and forth. But we don't know. We don't know the power that other people carry. Sometimes the most unobvious person is the greatest saint, has the closest communion with God. Ganga Mata loves to tell the story of of the monastery that was thinning out, and it was just about six, five or six really kind of old people. And it was just they couldn't attract anybody. They were grumpy with each other. It was miserable. And one of the, the, the abbot went to a holy man nearby, and he said, holy man, can you give us any advice? And holy, holy man said, what do you want me to say? <laughs> you know, this is your reality. I don't know what to tell you. But, and as the abbot was leaving, kind of just downhearted, he said, well, I will tell you this. I've heard that one of you may be the Messiah. <laughs> he said, really? He said, well, that's what I've heard. So he went back, and they said, well, what did he say? Did he give us advice? He said, no, he didn't give us any advice. He, but he said a very odd thing. He said, he said he had heard that one of us may be the Messiah. And they all looked at each other, and there was cranky old Bob, and there was, you know, um, Silent Joe, and there was, you know, uh, you know, the guy who just couldn't make anything work, and there was a guy who just did nothing but work, and they were just all, all over the map. And they just laughed about it. They said, you're kidding me. But then one by one, they started to think, gosh, what if it's true? What if behind that little masquerade of, of um, you know, absent-mindedness, because you know, the guy's absent mind is, he's always in the temple. He's really still in the temple. And the guy who's serving all the time, he's got so much kindness. And the, and the crabby guy, he holds the whole place together. And they started to see each other differently. They started to see each other through the eyes of 
the divinity that everyone carries, the divinity that everyone carries, and not through the, the superficial flaws, but the power of spirit. And in seeing each other that way, they started to remind each other, and they started to start to live up to what was being reflected back. And of course, the end of the story is that the monastery started gaining magnetism, and people started joining, because who doesn't want to be felt like that? Who doesn't want to be seen like that? Look around you. One of you may be the Messiah. And if you all go deep, maybe we all are. This world is desperate. This world is desperate for something else. And you have the remarkable good karma. You have the remarkable magnetism inside you to land in a place that gives you the tools to do something about it, more than out there shouting for peace, but to actually help change the consciousness of yourself. You know, parents, your children don't get your words, they get your vibration. That's what you can give them. Wives, your husbands don't get your, your, your messages or even your superficial kindnesses, they get your vibration, and husbands, the same thing. Teachers, employers, Everywhere you look, what people get from you. Was it Thoreau? Was it Emerson who said, who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. We should become so meaningfully, powerfully filled with the presence of spirit inside. Through the practice of yoga, through the practice of becoming still, that what people get from us are the things they're so desperate for in this world today. Let's take a moment of silence. <laughs> 